and I'm going to be sharing on repentance and how repentance and prayer go hand in hand. So as I was preparing this week, I started to ask myself, what is repentance? For those of you who don't know, I'm from Zimbabwe, and so I'm sure in my lifetime, somewhere, I've come across a few people who are named repentance. <laughs> so if there are any Zimbabwean parents in the house, this word is for you. Stop it right now. Stop naming your kids. <laughs> repentance. And I don't know how many of you are like me, and this was my definition of repentance. I thought repentance is a one-time thing. You know, you come to the house of the Lord, the Holy Spirit convicts you in a public declaration of your faith. You come to the front, you give your life to the Lord. You've confessed all sins, past, present, and future, one time, and that's it. That's how I understood repentance to be. Is there anybody else who, who, who saw it that way? Am I the only black sheep in the house? No, okay. There's a few of us. That's good. And my definition couldn't have been further from the truth. So I did what all of us do when we need information. I hit up my friend Google. And I said, Google, I want to know the Hebrew definition of repentance. And I was not prepared for, for what I found. So the Hebrew word for repentance is teshuva. Probably not saying it right. I'm not Jewish. Cut me some slack, okay? But it's teshuva. The meaning of the word teshuva is to return. To turn towards something that you've looked away from or strayed away from. Wow. That hit me. Because I, in my life, on several occasions, have looked away from the source of all hope have strayed away from our loving Father. And yet the Lord places teshuva in our lives. I looked a little bit deeper. Teshuva is found, it finds its root in the verb shuv, which means the word repentance in Hebrew is a verb. A verb is a doing word, which means it's a continuous motion. It's a continuous exercise. It's not a one-time thing, like I thought you come once and that's it. It's continuous. And even in that, we learn and we discover God's grace and mercy for us. God so much so does not want us to be away from him for a single day, let alone for eternity. That even before the cross came to be, as we're going to find out our scripture today is from the Old Testament, pre the cross. Even before the cross was a thing, God had already placed repentance in our lives and in our parts as an option for us to come back to him, to be brought back to the Lord. How incredible is that? Right? And so as I looked a little bit more, and I did a little bit more reading, and I'm going to need my notes for this one real quick. I found a scripture. Now, all my, my maths people, sure, you're going to love me for this one. Are there any maths people in the house? I'm not, I'm not one of them. But I'm safe. Okay, perfect. So in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it might come up over there. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. God calls us to humble ourselves, to pray, and to turn from our wicked ways. Now, all my maths people, in the RTC version of the Bible, that's the Russell Tinotenda Chirao version of the Bible, I call that the formula to solve for the X of repentance. I just lost half the room right now. <laughs> I just lost half the room. But for those of us who are like me, I'll simplify it. Humility plus prayer multiplied by turning to the Lord equals to repentance. Humility plus prayer multiplied by turning to the Lord equals to repentance. And so this notion of 
turning is essential. It signifies an intentional action, a committed action, a decisive action to turn back to the Lord. And so, as we get into our scripture for today, it's going to be very exciting because the scripture for today, if I can get some water down, the scripture for today, I found it comes up in three books of the Bible. Again, that's the RTC. If your NLT or NIT says something different, we can talk about this after the church, okay? But RTC version, I found it in three books. Isaiah, 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings. Tells the same story, which tells me that it was very, very important for us to hear this message. If we had randomly thumbed through our Bible one time and missed it in Isaiah, we're probably going to find it in 2 Chronicles probably going to find it in 2 Kings. And so, let me give you a bit of background, okay? I'm going to lay the foundation. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm laying the foundation. <laughs> it's very important. This is very important. I'm laying the foundation. You're going to have to follow me. Like I said, let's, let's dismiss the thoughts of lunch for now. And let's be here. And let's focus. I'm going to lay the foundation. And so, before we get to King Hezekiah, who is the subject of our topic today, we read in 2 Kings about a bunch of kings of the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. Now, I paused right there and I said, where did the nation of Judah come from? Now, if you remember last week, Monty mentioned that Kim is the one who struggles to keep up with the daily devotional. <laughs> so you and me, Kim, are in the same boat. I'd actually read about this before, but I'd forgotten about it because I skipped, still behind, 63 days behind, don't judge me. Um, <laughs> but I found that the nation of Israel, right, formed, was formed by the 12 sons of Jacob, who was later named Israel. These 12 sons became the 12 tribes of the unified nation of Israel. Are we following? This unified nation asked for a king, King Saul. They said, we want to be ruled. Other nations have kings. We also want kings. We don't want to be left behind. We don't want the FOMO of having a king. So we also want a king. And then God answered their prayer in the form of King Saul. King Saul deviated from the Lord. And then the Lord said, okay, you asked for a king. Now I'm going to give you one who is a man after my own heart. We got King David does amazing exploits, kills Goliath, writes so many songs and poems that till this day we still use to worship and pray to the Lord. King David's life comes and goes, then comes King Solomon, the wisest king to ever live, one of the wealthiest men to ever walk this earth, became the next king of Israel. And the nation is still unified. Are we following? After that, King Solomon passes away. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, becomes the king. Rehoboam decides the people, so the, the nation of Israel had 12 tribes. The 10 tribes in the north came to the king, Rehoboam, and said, your father Solomon worked us so hard, would you consider lightening the load on us? Rehoboam does something at the time when I read it, I thought, that's very wise, like your father. He says, let me consult my father's advisors. Consult his father's advisors. They say to him, if you respond in kindness to these people, they will follow you for the rest of their lives. And then Rehoboam did the millennial thing. He's like, okay, I heard the old men. Let me speak to my homeboys. Let me hear what they think. And in the vanity of youth, his homeboys said, Rehoboam, brother, you are the king. You are the main guy. You tell these people that they have not worked hard yet. Oh, they're about to know what hard work is. And so in my disappointment, King Rehoboam then follows his friend's advice, goes to back to the people, 
tells the people you're going to work hard, makes an analogy about his pinky, something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing. And eventually, these northern tribes decide to split. And so now we have two nations in one. We have the nation of Israel, the ten tribes in the north. Then we have the nation of Judah, which is the two tribes that remain faithful to the line of David, the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Ephraim. And so it is here that we hear about all these kings after Rehoboam, Rehoboam's son and his son and his son. All of them were doing what was displeasing to the Lord. It's a long line of them. Until we get to 2 Chronicles, chapter 29 is where it starts. We're introduced to Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, after a long line of kings who had done what was displeasing to the Lord, were introduced to him as the one who loved the Lord. In 2 Kings 5, or 2 Kings 18, I believe, from verse 5 to 6, it says that he loved the Lord. He followed his commandments. He did not stray away from the word of the Lord. But as we read a little bit deeper about our hero, Hezekiah, we find that he was often afraid. And when war approached his doorstep in the form of the Assyrian king that came to the footstool to the, to the doorstep of the nation of Judah, threatening war, what did Hezekiah do? He stripped the entire temple of its silver and gold to pay tribute to this king. Now, as I read on, I don't understand why the Philistines, the Assyrians, all these kings who were in opposition to God, why it was not enough for them to stop at insulting the king that they were beefing with at the time. No, they had to insult God himself as well. So this king comes and he says all sorts of things. Your God is not going to save you. He's not going to do this. You've seen what we've done. We've gone nation to nation. They claim to have gods. Their gods have done nothing. So if you call out God, you best believe you're going to get a response. And that's exactly what happens. God himself sends the angel of death to fight these Assyrians. Scripture says 185,000 of them were wiped out. Okay, the soldiers wake up the next morning. What they're seeing is corpses. And so king has a, this, this Assyrian king who came to fight the Judah, the nation of Judah, runs away in shame, goes back to his home country, meets a very sad end. He's actually put to the sword by his own sons. Are you still with me? So this is where we find ourselves now in our scripture for today, in the wake of all of this that has happened this war was supposed to happen miraculously. God steps in, and this is where we find ourselves in Second Chronicles chapter 32, from verse 24 to 26. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this story is told in three different books in varying detail. I've chosen this one because this is the more condensed version, but I'll give a bit of context as we go through it. Verse 24. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. This is after this miraculous victory has happened. If we read deeper, the prophet Isaiah at the time came to the king and said, The Lord has said, put your affairs in order. You're not going to recover from this illness. You're going to die. And as soon as Hezekiah hears this, it says he turns to the wall. We hear that word again, he turns to the wall. And he prayed to the Lord and cried out to him. And just before Isaiah had left the courtyard, God sends another message and says, I'm actually going to restore Hezekiah's health. Not only am I going to restore his health, I'm going to add 15 years to his life. So not only does God heal him, he also gave him a miraculous sign. Hezekiah asks the prophet Isaiah and says, how do I know that God is going to Heal me. How do I know this? The prophet Isaiah says, on the sundial, there's a shadow. Now, none of us know about this sundial life. Okay? We grew up in digital watches and, uh, and actual analog watches sometimes, but none of us were there unless there is someone who was here during the sundial era. But the sundial is how they used to tell the time back then. And so the shadow used to move in a very prescribed fashion. It only used to move forward. So Isaiah says, do you want the shadow to move 10 steps forward or 10 steps back? And he says, well, the shadow always moves forward, 
So I wanted to move 10 steps back. And God does this. So God defies the laws of nature to prove himself faithful to King Hezekiah. Verse 25. But Hezekiah did not respond appropriately to the kindness shown to him. And he became proud. As soon as Hezekiah got out of the bed, when he was well enough to walk, we read that the first thing he does, the nation of the Babylonians hear about all these amazing things that are happening in the land of Judah. There's this miraculous victory, this war. The shadows on the sundial are moving in opposite directions. We want to know what's actually happening here. So they send some ambassadors. And as soon as Hezekiah is able to walk again, he embarks on this journey of prideful, parading his wealth. He shows these Babylonians everything. He might as well have opened his app in today's time, opened his banking app, gave them the password, and showed them all his wealth. That's what he did. And so the Lord's anger came against him. The Lord has just fought your battle. The Lord has just moved this shadow in a way that it never does before. And instead of responding in glorifying the Lord, he said, and I quote, when the prophet Isaiah came to him and said, what have you done? He said, I showed them everything. I showed them everything I own. I showed them my vast treasures, my vast treasures. Hezekiah, weren't you in the bed three days ago about to die? But now he's saying, I show them my wealth, my riches. And so in verse 26, it then says, Then Hezekiah humbled himself and he repented of his pride, as did the people of Jerusalem. And listen to this. This is how good God is. So the Lord's anger did not fall on them during Hezekiah's lifetime. Thank you, Father, for the reading of your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is alive and active. It is in motion even now as we are gathered together as a family. Thank you. Lord, that your word is beginning to permeate the very, very, very deep and fortified places of our hearts. Help us, Father, today. Speak through these lips of clay and help us, Lord, to hear you. Amen. So we have just read about a king who had been the first in a long line of kings who are going against what God is about. He becomes the first one. The Bible even says that there was none other than no one like Hezekiah amongst the kings of Judah, either before or after him. Now, that puts him in, in very good company. He's esteemed. He's sort of like in the hall of fame of kings, if you will. And now he's in a place where he's feeling like, man, I'm the guy. So much so that when God moves in such a miraculous way in his life, not once, but twice, he doesn't respond in reverence to the Lord. He responds with pride. He responds with pride. And for me, before I got on my high horse at this point, as I was reading this and said, ah, Hezekiah, What's wrong with you? I immediately saw a little bit of Hezekiah in myself. Even as we've read this, is it possible that we have that same pride in our hearts? Is it possible that we too carry that thing that motivates us to flex on people. I'm trying to be like the cool kids, guys. To flex on people. <laughs> what that means... 
for those who may not know. <laughs> to show off. Are we motivated by our desire to show off? I did that. I built this. When all so clearly, it was God himself who even gave us the strength to get up in the morning, to go to work, and to earn the very living that we use to flex. So I said to myself, yo, God is so patient. God is so patient. Hezekiah, after his parade of pride, went back, came to his senses, and repented. And the Lord, again, showed his kindness and said, the terror that was meant to fall on you will not fall on you, it will fall into the next generation. And that spoke to me. That spoke to me because I often found myself in a similar position as Hezekiah. Now, I'm not a king. I haven't kinged over any kingdom yet. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but I've been privileged to see the hand of God so many times in my life. I remember a few years ago, I'm saying a few, but it, it really is quite a few. I fell ill. Very ill. And no doctor could explain what the illness was. Woke up one morning, had a terrible headache. The next thing I knew, I couldn't move. I was just bedridden for a month. Went to see all sorts of specialists. The one specialist says, well, we need to do a lumbar puncture to find the source of this temporary paralysis. My response was, I can't move my legs, but if you bring that needle close to me, I'm going to run out of here. And I remember my mom would come into my room each morning and the look that she had on her eyes to see her boy laid out and could not explain what it was. And so in the last gasp attempt, they said, let's go and find someone to pray for him. Then I found myself before uh, this man who they called a prophet. And he prays for me. And nothing happens for two, three days. But on day four, I began to regain my strength. And the first thing I went to do when I got my strength back, gathered all the homeboys and said, let's play a game of football, guys. I didn't go back to say thank you to this man who had prayed for me, let alone go back to my father in heaven and say, Lord, these legs that I'm using to kick the ball with were not functioning for the last two months. No, I was like, I need to have fun. I need to have me a good time. And so there's a little bit of Hezekiah. There's a little bit of pride in all of us. And God calls us to repent. He doesn't want us to be away from him. I'm going to say that again. The Lord does not want us to be separated from him. And that's why He's given us the ability to repent, to teshuva, repeatedly. The Lord calls us. Each time we fall short, he calls us to come back to himself. And that's his heart, that we would not be lost, that not one of us would be separated from his love. How good is our Father? 
how good is our Lord and Savior. And so, we cannot have repentance without prayer. I don't know what your initial definition of prayer was, but for me, at eight years old, I badly wanted a PlayStation 2. Who remembers PlayStation 2, guys? <laughs> hey, man, those were the glory days. I so badly wanted a PlayStation 2 that I would pray every day. For two years, I prayed. After every prayer, I'd be praying for food. Lord, thank you for the food that I'm having. And Lord, don't forget about my PlayStation 2. Dad, thank you for waking me up this morning. But remember, my PlayStation 2. Father, thank you so much for allowing me to see another day. But to let this be the day that I also see my PlayStation 2. <laughs> Incessant for two years. At the end of the two years, I got my PlayStation 2. But why did it take two years, Lord? <laughs> you see our hearts? Do you see our hearts? I got the PlayStation 2. But the first question is, why did it have to take two years, man? And sometimes that's what it takes. The Bible calls us to pray without ceasing. To pray without stopping. And even before I was saved, I got saved at 16. I was eight years old. And something in me knew that if I pester this man long enough, for those of us who have kids, we understand this. It's something in all children. They understand that if I pester you long enough, you're going to give me what I want. So God says, unless you become like these, unless you become like these little ones, unless you pester me like they do, unless you run after me like they do, and that's what prayer is. You see, prayer is not just, as we've been learning, it's not just submitting a long list of requests. Like we've got a long list of requests. Now it's not even PlayStation 2, it's PlayStation 5. I want a PlayStation 5, Lord. I hope Blue is listening to this, my birthday. <laughs> Need a PlayStation 5. No, it's not just a list of requests. Prayer is also about listening. About sitting with God in silence and saying, Lord, for a change, you speak. Every day I come before you with my worries, with my anxiety, with my stresses. But there's also a side of prayer where God calls us to sit and to listen to him. And so when we start to get into how repentance and prayer are interconnected, we start to see that repentance leads to prayer. When we feel sorry or remorseful for our sins and our actions and our shortcomings, that drives us into communication with the Father. I think of Psalm 51, where David cries out after his sin with Bathsheba. It's interesting that the name Bath was in her name. For those of you who know the story, she was bathing on the rooftop. And the name, the word Bath, probably doesn't mean the same thing in Hebrew, but it's interesting for me that in English today, <laughs> we know her as Bath. Sheba. It's almost like God had to say, you have to remember why she's mentioned in the Bible for bathing <laughs> in the most inappropriate place. And King David, his prayer is filled with repentance. He says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. This heart of mine that likes to look at women bathing on rooftops is not clean. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. And 
and we know what happened in the end. The very same Bathsheba is the one who gave birth to King Solomon. How good is our God? That he would use a crooked stick like me to draw straight lines this morning. That he would take a broken vessel and use it as a vehicle to share his word. How good is our God? So if you're taking notes, the second point of how repentance and prayer tie together. Prayer facilitates repentance. When we spend time in prayer, we invite the Holy Spirit to come and show us areas of our lives where we need to repent. And as we pray, as we continue to seek his face, we become more and more aware of our shortcomings. And lastly, both repentance and prayer lead to healing. As we saw in the story of King Hezekiah, he prayed. He turned away. He faced the wall. And as a result of his prayer, he received healing. And that same healing is available to you and I today. That same healing is available to you and I today. And so, how do we practically walk this out? How do we practically live out a life of repentance number one we need to make repentance a daily exercise whether it's journaling whether it's typing on your phone it's important to spend even a few minutes of your day just in silent self-reflection what is God saying to me today what areas do I need to repent of today I know for one, I need to stop swearing at people in traffic. So my prayer would be, Lord, help me to be more gracious. Help me to love people, to see them the way you do. And before I say, you in traffic, help me to remember that I too fall short. Number two, let's make sure that we repent in our prayers. Let's make repentance a daily feature in our prayers. Let's come to the Lord and confess. There's nothing that the Lord doesn't know about us in our lives. There's nothing we can hide. There's no place we can hide from Him. And yet he loves us as we are. Scripture says, before we were formed, he knew us. So the Lord knows you better than you know yourself. So daily, come to him. Come to him and let him draw out. Let him draw out each and everything inside of us inside of our fallen bodies that does not represent him. Last but not least, number three. We are in this community for a reason. To do life together. To share our burdens together. James 5, 16 says if we pray and we confess our sins to each other, the Lord 
The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. If you confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, you'll be healed. Some of the struggles we face in our lives just need the prayer of a friend, the prayer of a brother and sister, the prayer of community. So as we are in community, I invite us daily, not just here in this building, but in the circles of our lives, to pray for one another, to confess to one another, so we may be healed. So we may be healed. So this morning as I close off, I want to invite all of us, just close our eyes wherever we are. And as the band is going to come up and lead us in worship, I want us to settle ourselves, settle our spirits And ask the Lord to show us, show us those areas where he's calling us to repent. If you feel led to, feel free to rise, feel free to kneel, feel free to move around. But let's just use the next few minutes as the band leads us close our eyes to be still before the Lord just say Lord speak show me show me